So the question we've been discussing together is, what do you think will happen, what do you think happens in death? So who really knows? Uh, let's, let's know. Huh? So let's, let's share what's the sort of collective understanding or wisdom, and it will be varying I'm sure, uh, here amongst us. A anyone, just a, a brief statement. And I'll try and repeat, yes. Our atoms rearrange. Our atoms are rearranged. Yeah, that's certainly going to Personality continues as spirit. And what will continue? Our personality. personality. Our personality will continue? As spirit. As spirit. Okay, yes. <laughs> There's a spiritual reality. There's a spiritual reality? With, that continues. I mean, that continues. Great, okay. Yes? Fuller dimension of consciousness. Uh, we'll go in, into a transformed into a fuller dimension of consciousness. Yes? Gee, this is good. Yes. We're made of uh, matter and energy and neither is destroyed. So matter and energy is not destroyed, so there's some continuation, transformation. Yes? In this transformation of Okay, in this change of consciousness into a greater consciousness, we'll have a greater understanding of connectedness with everything. Okay, many near deaf experiences talk about that sort of consciousness. Yes? Yes, Paul? I have a friend in the valley who died almost age 91. He was fishing on Saturday, didn't feel too good on Sunday died on Monday and said before he left, I'm going on another great adventure. Are you going on another great adventure? Okay, so it's a great adventure. Okay, yes again. And even if there is nothing, it's been a great ride. Right, right. <laughs> even if there's nothing, we're not going to know about it. If I die in my sleep tonight and there's nothing beyond, am I going to miss it? No. Okay. But I guess one of the big, one of the big questions is, uh, when I die, granted everything we've said here, a transformation of energy into a greater consciousness, um, will, will I be aware that I'm Michael Morwood? Or will, will Michael Morwood give way to a greater consciousness? Because, because this is a human experience. And this is a human consciousness and, and, and maybe it's about being transformed into, a, as you say, a greater consciousness in which my awareness of being a, a human localized reality will give way to something greater. I don't know, but I want Michael Morwood to live and live and live. <laughs> uh -huh. And I guess that's part of our, of our, of our human psyche, wanting that. Uh, that's the big question for me. And, and again, if it doesn't, I'm not going to miss it. Uh, but it raises all sorts of issues like uh, communion of saints. Um, I, I believe my mother is present to me. Uh, where is my mother now? She's in this great consciousness. Is she aware of being Mary Morwood or is there another way of living on in this mystery in which she's still present to me? But it's not, a, not as a human reality anymore. It's a, it's a bigger reality. Who knows? Okay, so what I don't hear anyone saying either now or any other time is that when I die, I'm going to float up into the sky somewhere <laughs> and, and a God is going to judge about whether I get in or not. So here's the question, what happened to the Buddha when the Buddha died? What do you think happened? Same thing, same thing as today. Is that what Christian theology says? No. Poor theology says it. Sorry? Poor Christian theology. Poor Christian theology says. 
so we can label the catechism of the Catholic Church as poor Christian theology. Okay, right, you, you nailed it, you nailed it. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I grew up in the belief that before Jesus died, no one had access to the divine presence. You know, the whole theory of original sin. It was interesting, in 1978, 1998, when I was silenced in Melbourne because of writing Tomorrow's Catholic, and some months later I was due to go to New Zealand to speak at a theological symposium. And I don't call myself a, a theologian, by the way, but anyway, they invited me. So I went, I wanted to go. And the bishop, hearing I was banned in Melbourne, uh, wrote to me and said, Michael, you're welcome in my diocese as long as you give me your word that you believe and will teach that it's only through Jesus dying on the cross that humanity has access to heaven. And when the Archbishop of Melbourne condemned me for writing uh, Tomorrow's Catholic, in the letter he sent out to the Archdiocese, he had that same thing, that only through the death of Jesus can good people get to heaven. Catholic Catechism, the sort of, uh, that whole doctrine of disconnection and the importance of Jesus is, is that he gets us in. So how then do we talk about the death of Jesus and what happened to Jesus when he died? Did Jesus, as the creed says, he died, he descended into a shadowy place below the earth and everyone who died after Adam was down in this shadowy place, the limbo of the patriarchs it used to be called. He descended into hell and then God in heaven reached down and God in heaven on the third day took Jesus up into heaven. Christian creed, Christian theology and only through Jesus being taken up into heaven does humankind have access to God, became the Christian story. So I'll come back to that a little later in the afternoon, as in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Let me talk about the death of Jesus then, because what we'll see now, as I said before lunch, whether you take Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Resurrection, Pentecost, we have two stories. And there are two stories around Good Friday and the traditional theological, liturgical story is the story of Jesus dying for the sins of humanity because we were disconnected from God. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, in the Roman Catholic Church since the 1970s has issued documents and instructions to Catholic theologians that they must teach, that they must teach that the death of Jesus is an act, a redeeming act of sacrifice to the Father for the forgiveness of sins. That must be taught by Catholic theologians. So that's one story. The story that only through Jesus dying on the cross do we get to heaven. So Jesus is saviour because he gets us there. Are you saved? You get to heaven. We have all that theology. And generally that theology is played out in Christian liturgies on Good Friday. There's another story. What's the other story? The other story is to get below, to get below that Christology and to get in touch with the human story. What's the human story? So let's walk in the human story and then later this afternoon we'll look at where did the other story come from and why did it become so important and so, you know, so much the focus of, of Christian theology. So what's the human story? Well, continuing on from this morning, Jesus, I think, went to Jerusalem. It's like he, he stood up for what he believed and the powers that be put him away put him away. What's it like for Jesus of Nazareth to hang on a cross? That's the human story. And I grew up with a Jesus, and, and I remember, you know, right up to the time when I was ordained in 1969, I remember reading Raymond Brown, 
I have great respect for Raymond Brown. But it was in 1968 or 69 that, that Brian, Raymond Brown even introduced the question in terms of when Jesus was on the cross, did he know he was God? And he sort of left it open. And that was like, wow, to me. Because here I was about to be ordained a priest in the Catholic Church. And the Jesus that I knew in all my studies was a Jesus, the second person of Trinity, the Son of God. He had a divine will. He had a beatific vision. He, he knew the Father's will. And, and he knew what this was all about. It's like, yeah, kill me, but I know in three days I, I'm back to the Father. Well, what if it's not like that? What, what if Jesus is really human like me? What, 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 if, what if Jesus come to a stage of his life when life, not, not God, but life pulls this man apart? What, what if his dream's in tatters? What, what, is, what if he thinks he's a failure? What if he's asking the question, could I have done it differently? Why, why aren't the people with me? What, what, what's it like when, when your closest friends abandon you? What, what's it like... No, not, not just to be held up in, in ridicule, but what's it like to die a shameful, I mean, I mean physically atrocious death? I mean, humanly. You know, in, in all my life I had a Jesus hanging there. It was like, well, yeah, this is pretty bad, but I know I'm God and, you know, I put, the, put up with this for the sake of humankind. Now, the human experience, I have a Jesus said, my God, where the hell are you? Huh? What, what does, you know, if you're stripped of friendship, if you're stripped of companionship, if you're a failure, if you're facing incredible, incredible suffering, and you just walk through this? Hey, come on, come on, be real. Th this is like putting someone in, in, in the bottom of, of the darkest pit. And what I think Good Friday is about, I think Good Friday is about faith. I think it's about, what do you believe when life pulls you apart? And it's all right for you, Jesus. You can stand on, on, a, on a, you know, you can stand on the mountain and preach all this lovey, dovey stuff about, you know, the kingdom of God and God is with us in our love. But Jesus, you try being a leper. Jesus, you try being born blind. Or you try being a woman. You try being a woman who's tossed out of her home and has to turn to prostitution to survive and people look down their nose at you. It's all right for you, Jesus, to preach this lovely message. Get real. And here's life, as it were, catching up with Jesus of Nazareth. And life takes him and pulls him apart. And what do you believe now, Jesus? What do you believe now when life does this to you? And isn't that the human question, the ultimate spiritual, religious question? What do you believe when life breaks you? What do you believe when it all goes wrong? And my Jesus is hanging on a cross and it's like, life is tearing him apart. My God, where are you in this? And Jesus to me is like, I will not give up. I will not give up. I will not give up. I will not. Now that's faith. That's faith. This is not Jesus with the divine will over, over, overruling the, the, the human will and there's no agony. There, there's... There's no temptation to despair. You know, you turn him into a robot when you do that. I don't want to know that, Jesus. I want to know someone like me. And when I know someone like me, Jesus of Nazareth, Good Friday, is about looking at this Jesus. And he looks me in the eye and he says, Now, Michael, where are you? Where do you stand with this? Will you, will you live and walk in the faith, in, in the vision in which I'm ready to die? Will you do that? Or another way that Jesus of Nazareth encounters challenges on Good Friday, it says, well, Michael, you might talk this salvation language, but this is not about getting you to heaven. Michael, has your attention to me and my life and my story, has it set you free from fear of God? Has you set you free from notions that God is not with you in your everyday life? Or am I dying in vain? Have you really, have, have you really been set free? Have you really been uh, enhanced, ennobled by, 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 by listening, by being with me? 
If, if not, I haven't set you free. I, I haven't saved you. You know, you, you're still in those thought patterns and those imageries and those religious practices that make you think you've got to buy God's love or you've got to, you know, be fearful of God or you've got a God who pulls strings. That's the question of the Good Friday. Where are you? Where are you? Look at me. It's about faith. For me, Jesus dying on a cross has nothing, absolute nothing to do with getting me to heaven. Absolutely nothing to do with that. It's all about, it's all about Jesus and his dream and the divine present here with us. On Good Friday, we Christians have this lovely practice that we have the cross and people come forward on Good Friday. And on Good Friday, as with communion, I will walk shoulder by shoulder with people who are into a different story and they will walk to the cross and they'll pick it up and they'll kiss the cross and they'll thank Jesus for dying for our sins and for getting us into heaven. And I, 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 I would not want to question that for anyone. And we'll walk together with this. But when I pick up the cross and I hold it or kiss it or even dance with it, then I'm wanting to ritualize something about me. And I'm wanting to ritualize, I look you in the eye, Jesus, and I embrace your cross, I embrace your story. I will live this. Two stories. We've got to stop saying, your story's wrong. You're not in my story. You can't be a Christian. No, there's richness in both stories. There's loyalty. There's in incredible fidelity to Jesus in both stories. We've got to learn to live side by side with both stories. And if people want to criticize me and say, as they will, well, you're not a Christian because you don't believe, you know, what the catechism of the church says, I say, fine. But there is another story. And it would be good at least to hear that story. So Jesus dies. And then the question that we, we started with, where did Jesus go when he died? I'm not into this worldview anymore. I'm not into a worldview that said humankind was disconnected from God and no one before Jesus had access to heaven and Jesus went down to some shadowy godless place. And on the third day, God reached in and God took Jesus up into heaven. I'm not into that imagination anymore. And if I'm not, I'm not into the creed. I'm not into the imagination of Paul. I'm not into the imagination that has shaped most Christian Christology for 2,000 years. This is, this is the biggest shift ever in Christian theological thought. It is. You know, I, I always, I, 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 you know, I, I can remember exactly where I was. I was actually in Canada, on the west coast of Canada. I can remember exactly where I was, sitting in a restaurant, talking with people, and, and, and it hit me. You know, the resurrection is not the Big Bang event of religious experience. And that's the way it's been told, as, as if, you know, this, this was the big bang event of religious experience. No one before Jesus ever had access to God. And it hit me, that's not true. That is not true. Australian Aboriginal people for 40,000 years before Jesus. And they lived in love and they died in love into the mystery of God. And everything that we said today about death being a transformation into a greater consciousness, a greater reality, that's always been true of humanity. It's always been true. So what do we think happened to Jesus when he died? Or where is Jesus today? Is he up in heaven? Gee whiz, does that, does that sort of question some of our liturgical images or our thinking, imagination? So what's the resurrection all about? 
because I certainly don't think anymore it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's the event that marks humankind's entrance into heaven. You're not going to say that in a 10 minute homily on Easter Sunday, are you? No. And that's why, you know, the, the, the change and the tension we're, we're, we're in is, is, is so tough. It, it's because this, this is such a, a, a change of, of such magnitude, you know, that we need our scholars, we need our theologians, you know, in, into a whole new appreciation, a new story to tell us this. And yet leadership is saying, no, 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 you, you, you will not, you know, the, the, the death of Jesus was, was an act of sacrifice to the Father. The other, the other theological uh, demand that Joseph Ratzinger put on Catholic theologians since the 1970s is that Catholic theologians must believe and teach that the resurrection of Jesus was a physical event. Uh, it's time for Catholic theologians around the world to stand up and say that's nonsense. It is, it's nonsense, it's nonsensical. It's not a physical event. Where's the body? And then you want us to lit literalize the ascension? One of my sisters who I love so dearly and if I walked on water, Mary would not be surprised. <laughs> she, she loves me unendingly. But Mary lived most of her adult life across the road from a very, very conservative Catholic priest who I think never even heard of Vatican II. I mean, he did, obviously, but, you know, it's like, you know. So, so Mary is old-school Catholic. You know? Loves me to death and loves to hear me talking and then we'll say, but, you know. So Mari and I were flying across the Pacific on Qantas, coming to LA, and we're at 37,000 feet. And the pilot says, you know, we're flying at 37,000 feet. The outside temperature is minus 47 degrees Celsius. And I turned to Mari and I said, looks bad for the ascension, doesn't it? <laughs> So you can't literalize it. You can't literalize it. So what do we do? We take the gospel stories around resurrection, which grew up much later, of course, and we take those stories to, to deal with the mystery that we deal with. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to me with death. I don't know what happened to my mother when she died. I can talk about it. But is my mother present to me? Of course she is. Do I believe in a communion of saints? Of course I do, okay? So l let us tell stories. And so people told stories about Jesus. Death was not the end. Yes, hallelujah. Death is not the end of Jesus. He's still with us. Yes, yes, yes. So what did they do? They told stories. You know, we were walking along and he was with us. We had fish and chips on the beach. In John's Gospel. He came through the walls. Hey, they're storytellers. He stood on the hill and up he went up into heaven. Well, they're trying to say to us, death was not the end, he went to God. Where, where do they think God was? Up there. So they told stories. But don't literalize the stories, engage the mystery. The stories are simply a vehicle for the mystery. Death is not the end of Jesus, he's still with us. Yes, I, I can believe that. So what then is Pentecost? <coughs> Again, see, we have an institutional story, and it's in our scriptures. Jesus went up into heaven, and 50 days later, he sent the Spirit down just upon this little group there. No one else, no one else, and hallelujah, the Christian church began. 50 days after Easter. Well, no, it didn't. And we'll see this again later. The separation between the followers of Jesus and the Jewish religion does not take place until about the 80s. 
about 50 years after Jesus died. So, we've got to hold that story. We've got to hold that story and say, we'll come back later this afternoon and see where it came from. Put the story aside. Now let's look at how might we tell the story of Pentecost? How might we tell the story next week? No, you can't do this in 10 minutes, I'm sorry. But how might we understand it? Let's go into our worldview. I think Pentecost works something like this. This was the world, this was the reality that Jesus lived in. He tried to get people to see what he saw. Didn't work. Jesus died into the mystery of God. He's gone, but he's still with us. Now, we then, let us now play this out. Let us be the Jewish followers of Jesus of Nazareth in the years after he died, because this is a Jewish movement. Now, so we begin to gather. We gather in our homes, as the Acts of the Apostles says, for the breaking of the bread. This is not Eucharist, this is Jewish custom, the breaking of the bread. And what we begin to do is we begin to tell the stories around Jesus of Nazareth. And we begin to say, remember when, remember when he did this, remember when he did that, remember the time. And I remember the time when he said this will touch me. One of the key things that we most treasure is the story that the way Jesus died. This man, he, he, he gave his life for what he believed. So as we begin to tell the stories of Jesus, remember we are Jews. We're not talking Christological language yet. We begin to say, in this man Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord was certainly upon him. And in this man Jesus, we have seen something of the very, the very breath, the very Spirit of God. This is good Jewish language. Another way you could say this is Jesus so, he lived so lovingly that, that he lived in love, he died in love, and in that we, we saw something of, of, of the God of love. In him we've seen in human form something of the reality of the mystery we call God. They're not talking second person of the Trinity language. You can say son of God, yes. So what we're doing as Jews, we're extolling this man, this man Jesus, through whom, through whom as Peter says, well, the lips, the speech that's put on the lips of Peter at Pentecost chapter 2, this man Jesus through whom God did wonderful things, this man, God took him into heaven. So we're talking about this man Jesus through whom God did wonderful things and he was so faithful that he lived in love, he lived in God and God lived in him. Wonderful, wonderful. So that's one thing. So one side, we're talking about Jesus, and it's like, wow, what a man, what a man. The other side is this. As we begin to tell the stories around Jesus, then we begin to say, but he kept saying to us, didn't he? Let go of fear. Didn't he keep saying to us, reflect on our own everyday living and loving? Could it be true? That if we live in love, that the same spirit that lived in Jesus lives in us? So here's the crunch. When Jesus was preaching to the crowd, the Spirit of God was there. The Spirit of God was in the crowd. But it was not able to break through because of their conditioning. What happens now is they start to gather around the story of Jesus. And as they gather around the story of Jesus, the way he died, what he is ready to die for, and he's preaching, that story is like, like, like the, 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 the charge that starts to tick the spirit within them. Oh, now I begin to see it. Oh, if we visit, if we care, it's like, hey, we're in love and, 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 and the same spirit that we see in Jesus is in us. Could, could it be true that the same spirit in Jesus is in us? Here's the crunch. Why do you gather, do we gather around the story of Jesus? In this scenario, 
We don't gather around the story of Jesus simply to say, oh, wasn't he a great guy? He's better than us and, and he's ontologically different from us and we put him up on a pedestal. No, we tell the story of Jesus so that as we tell the story of Jesus, the spirit that's in us recognises the truth of what he says and the spirit in us begins to come to the surface. In other words, Pentecost, the dawning of the Spirit, the Spirit's here. It's not going to drop down from heaven. It's here. Jesus knew that. So why do, we, why do we gather around the story of Jesus? You know, for 2,000 years, Christianity has gathered around the story of Jesus to tell us that he's different from us, ontologically. He's the Son of God. He's, he's totally and utterly different from all of us. He has, he's got a divine nature we don't have. He has a divine will we don't have. Now, that's not the original story. Again, we'll see that comes in the second half of the first century. No, the Pentecost movement was this sense of we gather around the story of Jesus and this story allows the Spirit to come to awareness in us. So how are we going to tell the story of Pentecost? One story says, yes, Jesus went up and he zapped one group and this group got the spirit and through that spirit got access to heaven and then you institutionalise that. We'll see this later today. And then we say, now, we've got the entry into heaven and if you want to get in, you have to come into our group. Pentecost, the birth of the church. And what is it? It's divisive. It's elitist and it is not the message of Jesus of Nazareth. It is not the message of Jesus of Nazareth. And there's another story that says the divine, creative, energizing spirit is everywhere and when we gather around the story of Jesus it allows the spirit that is everywhere and within us to come to consciousness. And then we ritualize that in baptism and in Eucharist. Ah, this is who we are. And what could have happened and in the book Sand from Solid Ground, where I talk about the change and the way things shift. I mean, metaphorically, if I could cry over what happened, this is what I would cry over. That here we had this incredibly great story for humanity. If we'd had stayed true to this, that the followers of Jesus of Nazareth could have gone to the world. They could have come to the Australian Aboriginal people. And they could have said, as we gather around the story of Jesus, we have had this insight that everyone who lived in love, lives in God, we're all connected. And, and the way that we gather around Jesus helps us to see this. Now tell us, Aboriginal people, as you gather around your stories, what, what's your insight? And the Australian Aboriginal people would have said to us, well, go and reflect on the earth as mother. Go and reflect on the land. Go and see the divine, creative, great spirit close to you. And of course they'd tell their legends and we don't have to literalise them. But they'd say to us, get out of your head. Get out of your head and get into nature and see the divine. Or if we went to China or South America or Asia, we, we, we had Christianity had at its disposal a story of connectedness that we could have taken to the world and we could have set the world free from fear and superstition and from this idiotic religious network of violence and division and we've got God and you haven't that torments humankind. We had it at our disposal. It's there in the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And what do we do? Within 50 years of Jesus dying, we demolish that. Not that it's there in the way I'm talking about it, but it was there. And we demolish that. And we got into this. And we told a different story. We didn't tell a story about the divine everywhere and all people. No, we got locked into the story of the God in heaven who disconnected, 
And then we got into a story that only we have access to that God. And we can tell you what this God thinks. Doesn't it want to make you cry? Come on. So when people are critical, as people are, you know, they'll say, they'll say to me, for example, you know, I, I hear you denying the resurrection. I say, I'm not denying the resurrection at all. I'm just simply saying you have to understand that as we today would understand death and the continuation of life beyond death. But don't interpret it in the worldview of 2,000 years ago, you know, up there. Well, I, I, hear, I hear you saying that, you know, the birth of the church is not a Pentecost. I say, well, go and read the history books. Go and look at the scholars. The scholarship's there. It didn't happen like that. Go and find another story. Well, I hear you denying that Jesus died for our sins. Well, well yeah, I mean, I mean a different story. You stay in your story if you like. But don't tell me I'm not faithful to Jesus. Don't, don't tell me that I'm not honouring Jesus or I'm not honouring the mystery of God. So there's the rub for us, isn't it? Here we are in this time of great, great change. And what we need to do in this time of great change, of course, that's why I wrote the book From Sand to Solid Ground. Because I grew up Catholic thinking we Catholics were on solid ground and it would never change. And then I discovered late in life that the the ground was shifting. And a lot of what I thought I'd never, never, never question, now it's like it's all up for question. It's all up for question. And what I want to see in Christianity and in Roman Catholicism in particular, I want to see intellectual honesty. I want to see an openness to truth. I want to see an end to this control over people's minds because the control enhances, you know, institutional power and authority. That's not being honest. The scholarship is there, let's open it up. So let's have another f five, 10, 15, 20, how long? <laughs> how long a break will we have? Five. <laughs> five, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. You got a five and a half. <laughs> For a period of 20 years or so, after Jesus died, there was a Jewish movement known as The Way, the followers of Jesus, preaching Jesus' message around the Kingdom of God. And then in the 50s, Paul of Tarsus begins to preach. And Paul, Paul is trying to expand Judaism. We have to be very clear about this. Paul is not trying to start a new religion. He has no intention of doing that. He's trying to expand Judaism by using the preaching of Jesus that he sees inviting people who do not have to keep all the law to come into the Jewish community life. And so Paul focuses on the Gentiles. I always thought before I read Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan that the Gentiles referred to, you know, sort of the pagans who had no association with Judaism. And their writings enlightened me to the fact that no, the Gentiles that Paul is associating with are people who have contact with the Jewish community. They're called God-fearing people, the God-worshippers. And then when you go through the Acts of the Apostles, you actually see that in Paul's journeys, he always goes to the synagogues and he'll say he taught there for three months preaching and he's trying to bring people on the fringe life, non-Jewish people who respected Jewish life and the Jewish idea of God but they were not Jewish. So Paul sees in the message of Jesus a way of bringing the Gentiles into the Jewish life. So Paul preaches to the Gentiles, to the Jews, and then he also preaches in the marketplaces. So he tries to engage the Greco-Roman world. And that's where he encounters his biggest problem. Because encountering the Greco-Roman world, he encounters the, the great religious question 
of the Greek Roman world. Now the Greeks thought that Junoism was a strange religion. It had belief in a personal God who had immediate contact with this world, a God who intervened and, you know, arranged the way things were. The Jewish people believed that creation was good. Now, now for the Greeks, that, 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 was, that was unimaginable. Greek philosophical thought had, had a total separation between, you know, the Platonic world of, of, of Plato, where, you know, pure essence, where the one was, and they had a demiurge between that world up there and this material changing world where nothing lasting could be. So the question, the religious question for the Greek world and the Roman world was, how do we gain immortality? Because you cannot gain it here on earth. There has to be some way that when we die, that our souls get from this drag me down second rate place, get up to where the pure essence is. So how do you do that? Well, Greek philosophical thought said, well, if you got your ideas right, then you might be able to do it. The astrologer said, well, we can get you, you know, through all the stars and, and we can get you there. We can plot a path for you. The mystery religions like Dionysius and Mithra said, ah, you come into our story and you gather around the story of Dionysius, which is a very, very attractive religion, dancing, erotic dances, and there was no fasting, and you didn't have to keep any laws, it was a joyful, but gather around the story of Dionysius, and the spirit of Dionysius will come into your life, and you will win immortality. The Romans got from Persia the religion of Mithras, and they spread the story of Mithras, the religion of Mithras through the empire. Mithras was born on the 25th of December. Mithras was the good shepherd. He had 12 apostles. He was the way, the truth, and the life. He died, he was buried, he rose after three days. Does this all sound familiar? <laughs> hey? Mithras, the religion of Mithras. So come into our story and Mithras will get you there. So the question that Paul confronted in this world was, is your Jesus better than Mithras and Dionysius? Can your Jesus get us there? Because that was the burning religious philosophical question. And, 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 and Paul, not only Paul, but the followers of Jesus had to give an answer. And, 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 and if, Jesus, if Jesus had nothing to say to that, then why should we listen to Paul? This, this movement has, has nothing to say to our world. So Paul has to engage that question. I heard John Dominic Crossan speak in Chicago two years ago. And he relates the story. He said, he said, a friend of mine, a Muslim, said to me, Dom, the difference between you Christians and us Muslims is that we Muslims were content to have Muhammad a prophet, but you Christians made Jesus into a God. And John Dominic Crossan's response to him was, I tell you, if Muhammad had lived in the first century, you would have had to make him a God for anyone to take any notice of him. And that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. That's what Paul is confronting. If Jesus cannot be the answer to our question, he's irrelevant. So now you have the preaching that begins to focus on Jesus as the way to the heavenly heights. Now we, let's be very clear about this. My criticism of Paul is, is precisely that we're trying to walk in the human reality of Jesus of Nazareth and the urgency of his task for the here and now of human existence. That, that's where I want to stay anchored. But now you get this major distraction, and the major distraction now is 
can Jesus get us into heaven? And so Paul says, yes. And so now you get the preaching of what we know as the Christ. That Jesus is taken into heaven, and Paul says, and he is anointed the Christ, the Christos, in heaven. This is a heavenly anointing. It's not an earthly task. So why is Jesus anointed in heaven by God? For what task? Well, Paul's first preaching is he's anointed, taken up into heaven to be the judge of the living and the dead because the end times are coming. 1 Thessalonians, the first letter that we have of Paul. But then the end times don't come. So, well, we still hang on to that. Okay, well, he'll be the judge of the living and the dead whenever it comes. But now the Christology shifts to an understanding, yes, he, he's taken up into heaven, is appointed in heaven, he becomes the Son of God, well, not that he becomes, he becomes the anointed one, and now in heaven he is charged with releasing the Spirit upon us, he wins forgiveness of sins, and he gains for us access to the heavenly heights. This is the work of the Christ. So in the latest book, it's time I keep asking the question, Paul, where did you get this from? You did not get it from Jesus. I think it's obvious. Paul, you did not get this from Jesus. It's not what he preached, it was not his concern. So from Paul, I'm not blaming Paul for all that followed, but certainly from the foundation of Paul, you know, Christianity starts running with a Christology that, that is mainly focused on, on Jesus as a cosmic figure, the one who gets us into heaven. So Christianity focuses on the idea of this connection and Jesus gets us there. Well, uh, uh, okay, as, as, as long as you don't destroy or, or, or lose focus of what Jesus got out of bed for, as long as you don't lose focus about what Jesus was ready to die for. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus certainly did not believe in a God withholding forgiveness. Jesus did not go to the crowd and say, well, you know, God is not with you, but God's with me, but I'll get you in. I mean, that's not the message. Everything we did this morning, Jesus, Jesus is trying to convert the crowd to see the presence of the divine with them. Jesus did not believe in a God who locked us out of heaven. He didn't. He did not believe in a God who withheld forgiveness. But now this theology begins to take root. You can't blame it all on Paul, but the start is there. So now we get the idea, you know, if Jesus is not risen, well, let's pack up and go home. There's no hope for us. Paul, where'd you get that from? Jesus didn't preach that. Now you get the idea that through the Christ in heaven, you know, all of creation comes through the Christ. Paul, where'd you get that from? It might be a nice, a nice, you know, mystical idea, Paul, but, but it's not what Jesus preached about himself. It was not the concern of Jesus. And then the writers of Christology then say what happens then is that after Paul, when Paul is preaching, his own Jewish listeners become to be disconcerted by this. It's, it, it's like as one writer saying that, that Paul is giving to Jesus the attributes that belong to God. Paul's not making Jesus God, he's not doing that, it comes later. But some of the attributes that belong to God, it's for God to be merciful. Not, not for a human to win it. It, it, it. It's for God to grant God's presence. It's not conditional on some, some, some earthly person doing something. That's not Judaism. So within the ranks of his own religion, people become to be disconcerted. And then especially when Paul is saying, we well, you know, well, Jesus has actually released you from the fullness of the law. That's very disturbing. So Paul, Paul dies around the mid-60s, we think. And around, just as he dies, you have the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire and the Roman army. 
that lasts for four years, a time of terrible, terrible violence. And in the, around the year 70, Jerusalem is totally and utterly destroyed by the Romans, wiped out, the temple destroyed. The end of the temple priesthood. What happens then is that out in the villages, in the towns, it's up then to, to the, the lay leaders to keep faith alive in the face of this utter devastation. Imagine what it's like to be a Jew. The temple has been destroyed. You know, what is God saying to us again? I mean, this happened, you know, 600 years ago when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple and we were not keeping the covenant. What is God saying to us? We're not faithful again. So on the local level, on the village, town level, the lay leaders, the Pharisees, in the synagogue movement, are trying to keep Jewish faith alive. So if we were to transpose ourselves back to around the year, the early 70s, let us go to Antioch in Syria and let us be a Jewish community. Let me be the Pharisee leader of this community. In the face of this utter devastation, I'm trying to keep faith alive. But here in my community are the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm trying to say we have to get back to keeping the law. We have to get back to the covenant. God's punishment is clearly upon us. And this group is saying, oh, but Jesus has released us from the law. Huh? You don't have to keep the law. The, that, that, that covenant is not the important one now. It's like gather around the story of Jesus. This for me, this for me is totally subversive. It's dangerous. It, it's subverting our religion. So we begin to say, ostracize these followers of Jesus. If your daughter's there, you cut off from her. Father against son, mother against daughter. You stop employing people who are followers of Jesus. Where do we see this? We see it in Matthew's Gospel. Mark's Gospel comes out around the year 70. Mark, Mark takes the Christology of Paul, puts it onto the baptism of Jesus. You know, the heavens opened and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. You know, as if in the baptism of Jesus, it's revealed to Jesus and everyone else, he is the heavenly Christ. Hey, no, that's an overlay. Totally, totally, you know, sort of distorting the human reality I talked about this morning. And so for 2,000 years, Christians go, I look at the baptism, see the story, oh, Jesus knew he was the Christ. What Christ? They knew he was the Christ of Paul. You know, the heavenly. Oh, no, hang on, no, no. A big change just took place here. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel is basically a Jewish document. This community I just talked about, someone, has to be a male, <laughs> we're, we're disturbed by being ostracized. We take the Gospel of Mark and we add to that we add to it infancy stories. One, because if, if, if Jesus is to be, you know, better than Mithras, who had a virgin birth, and Dionysius, who had virgin birth, and, and, and Caesar Augustus, who also had a virgin birth, uh, you know, and everyone knows he didn't, uh, well, well, you've got to give Jesus a virgin birth. So you, you add these stories, and then you add your Jewish Annunciation stories, so you present that at the beginning of the but now we're Jews. So we want to say to our Jewish brethren, hey, hang on here, you're persecuting us, but Jesus, Jesus is the new Moses. Hey, he, he's the fulfillment. So in Matthew's Gospel, you have Jesus saying, I, I, I've not come to change one iota of the law, I've come to fulfill the law. So the writer here takes the Gospel of Mark in his infancy story, he presents a slaughter of infants. We're all Jews, where else is there a slaughter of infants in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible? <laughs> Moses, okay, yeah, Moses, okay. <coughs> where, where do Mary and Joseph go? They go to Egypt. 
In, here's, here's a trivia question for you. <laughs> in, in Luke's Gospel, in Luke's Gospel, what is Jesus' grandfather's name? Yeah, there's a question. There's a question. His grandfather. I don't think so. Could be. Is it Joachim? It's not the translation I had anyway. In Matthew's Gospel, it's different. <laughs> in, Ma in, in the Old Testament, here's the story of Joseph. You know the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Who was his father? Jacob? Abraham. No, 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 Abraham. <laughs> now you're confusing me. Abraham was you're not the father. You're talking to Catholics. You're talking to Catholics. <laughs> anyway, Matthew changes the name so that Joseph's father is the same name as the name of Joseph in the Old Testament, okay? Just making that association. Whereas Luke's Gospel has a different name for Joseph's father's name, okay? He comes back from Egypt, and where does he go? What does Jesus do? No. Where does he begin to preach? <laughs> Ma Ma Matthew's Gospel has this thing at, at the start, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> okay, so he goes up to a mountain. Okay, so what, what, what what the writer here, what the editor is trying to say to his Jewish brethren and to the Jewish community, why are you persecuting us? Jesus is the new Moses. Look at the Beatitudes. It, it's the fulfillment of, 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 of the Jewish dream of living God conscious. This man is not destroying the law, he's fulfilling the law. Stop persecuting us. In today's terms, we'd say, we're more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> eh? You know, we're more Jewish than you are. Stop persecuting us. But it doesn't work. And so what happens in the 80s is that the followers of Jesus are ostracized. One, because you're giving to Jesus the attributes that belong to God. Secondly, it's like you're undermining the importance of the law. And thirdly, you are undermining my authority as Pharisee leader of the community. That's why in Matthew's Gospel you have Jesus fulminating against the Pharisees. He would never have done that. He would never have done that. But it makes sense in this community to pull the Pharisees down, make them the bad guys. That's when the split starts. So you're driven out. Okay, you drive this group out. What's it like now that you're driven out? Yeah, precisely. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, hey this, this is a tough place to be. We've been driven away from our mother religion. So now we, we as a movement, have to give ourselves an identity that distinguishes us from you. So what we begin to do, we begin to highlight the Pauline theology. And what does that theology because, let me say before, before that, the way of Jesus is not a threat. Eh? It, it's perfectly Jewish to live the Beatitudes. It's a perfect Jewish way of life. What upsets the Jewish community is giving these attributes to Jesus. Okay? So what we now begin to do is to say, okay, we highlight this theology and we begin to focus that in Jesus we have access to God and you don't. And that's the crucial movement. So now, then, you institutionalize this belief and you gather around this belief that what sets us apart is that through faith in Jesus, we have eternal salvation <laughs> and you don't. And what you become are the unfaithful Jews who persecuted, you killed Jesus. That becomes part of our story as well, even in John's Gospel. So then at the end of the first century, you get the Gospel of John. And I'm not an expert on the Gospel of John, but I know enough to look at it 
and say, basically, for all the lovely poetry and for all of it that I can, you know, uh, appreciate, you know, we are one, we're all one, yes, all that, the undivine with all that, but basically it's an institutional gospel. It's a God out there who sent his son to earth. We didn't recognize he went back. Joseph Ratzinger constantly quotes John's gospel out of context. No one can come to the Father except through me. Catholic Catechism does the same. So you set up this, this idea that uh, and then John's gospel then preaches Jesus. So you have Jesus standing on the street corner saying, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the bread, I'm the living water, I'm the tabernacle, no one can come. It's like, what? That's not what Jesus did. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. John's gospel preaches Jesus as the unique saviour of the world. No one except me. What a change in 50 years, huh? What a change in 50 years. You institutionalize this, you institutionalize the story, the theology about separation, and now only through faith in Jesus can we get to heaven. That becomes our story. That became the Christian bedrock, the Christian story. Jesus and Jesus alone wins access to heaven. And then, of course, it becomes, and if you don't come into our group, you're not going to get there. I mean, what a story to have at your disposal. The problem then becomes a major problem. The major problem then, the major question becomes, who then is Jesus if Jesus and Jesus alone wins access to the heavenly realms where God lives? Who is he? Because no human person can do this. So for 300 years you have this in intense argumentation and becomes very, very, very bitter. And both sides in the, the major argument, both sides are, are arguing from the perspective that because of Adam's sin we were locked out of heaven. So both sides are locked into this perspective of disconnection from God and the question, well, how do we get back in and who is Jesus that he gets us up there? So the conservative side is saying, now, Jesus does not have to be God. Jesus was a human, he was obedient, and God raised him, and because he was obedient, God rescued us and allowed us all to get to heaven. The main proponent of that was a man called... You can tell me. No, not Paul. A heretic. I hope all you people who are listening do better than this. <laughs> Arius. 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 Thank you. Arius. Okay. So that became the Arian heresy, that Jesus was only a man who by his obedience overcame Adam's sin and won access to heaven. The liberal side was proposed by, here we go again, <laughs> Who, who, who was the main proponent for the, the liberal that Jesus has got to be God? If he's not God, it doesn't work. We don't get in there. And he was Saint, Saint, Saint. No, not Augustine. Before Augustine. Starts with A, though. Athanasius. Okay, it's an Athanasius. Okay. So the... I'm sorry. The historians tell us that the Arians, you know, like you had priests who followed Arius and whole communities who followed Arius, you had whole communities that followed Athanasius, and they broke out into open warfare. Historical fact, they were burning houses, they had open warfare in the streets over this question, and they were driving priests out of their villages and out of the towns. When Constantine became emperor, the biggest uprest in his empire in the east were Christians fighting one another over this question. So in 325, Constantine said to the bishops of the East, remember this is not Rome, it's not the, the Western Church, it's the Eastern Church, to the bishops of the East, 320 of them I think, you will come to my summer residence at Nicaea and you will put an end to this fighting and you will put an end to the discussion. 
Now, Constantine sided with Athanasius, and Constantine was at Nicaea, and his soldiers were there, making sure. There's also a bit of political intrigue here, because the church wants Constantine to answer to the church. And if the church can have Jesus as a God figure, then Constantine will have to answer to Jesus and the church. If Jesus is not a God figure, then Constantine's the God figure, and the church answers to Constantine. So there's political intrigue here as well. So the bishops, after much discussion and a bit of urging from Constantine, they declare that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father. We get the Nicene Creed. That what it, basically what it comes down to, that is the only way that humanity wins access to God's dwelling place in heaven is if Jesus has a divine nature that we do not have. He has to be a divine nature, consubstantial with God's self. We humans just have a human nature. Okay, 325. 35 years later, at Cilicia Rimini, Constantine's son called another council and double the number of bishops came to it, double the number of the East again. There are only one or two representatives from Rome and they overturned Nicaea. And we don't hear about it. The history books simply say, oh, that was an Arian council and dismiss it. And I want to say, oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Constantine called the first council. An emperor called the second council. And we know historically, every council called in the first thousand years were called by the emperor, not by the pope. You can't have it both ways. If you want to say that Nicaea is, you know, the sort of God's last word on something, then the second council, you've got to say, is God, God's last word on something. So the Arians won. And then Constantine's grandson, at the end of the fourth century, turned back to the Athanasian Creed, and he sent out an edict through his empire, and the edict says that no one, no one will publicly dissent from the findings of the Council of Nicaea, and if they do, they will be declared demented and insane, and will receive the full force of the emperor's punishment. You will not talk about this again in public. Right down to the 21st century. <laughs> you will not talk about this in public. You will not question the Nicene Creed. There's no way you can do that and call yourself a Christian. It's the bedrock. Well, let's go back a bit. This is all about answering the problem, who is Jesus, that he gets us into heaven because God locked us out because Adam and Eve sinned. You're giving me the answer to a question that's not my question anymore. It's not my question. I don't believe in literalizing the Adam and Eve story. I don't believe in a God who locked us out. You're asking me to give creedal assent to a perspective that is unreal. You are asking me to base my Christian Catholic faith on unreality. It is. Today it's unreal. It seemed real to them, and I respect that. But it's not real today. It's... it's what? How can you believe that? So how do you bring faith to the 21st century? You're not going to do it if you just keep saying, no, you will not talk about it. Here in this country, highlighted the last 12 months or so with the religious sisters. And here's, here's Rome for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith saying, you will not publicly question doctrine. And the sisters saying, they're not saying this, but you know, the, the movement is, well, hang on, we, we have questions about it. I mean, we're educators, we're with people. We know what the issues are. Y you can't simply just you know, dump this faith perspective in the 20, on people in the 21st century because I don't believe it. 
There are other stories, there are other ways of bringing Jesus to the 21st century. Can't we dialogue about this? No. Do you believe the Nicene Creed? Yes or no? Do you believe Jesus is consubstantial with the Father? Yes or no? If you say no, you are not a loyal Catholic. That's got to stop. That has to stop. I never thought I'd write another book last year. In July of last year, I said to Maria, I think I've got to write another book. <laughs> and that's why I wrote It's Time. It's Time. When are our theologians as a body going to stand up and say, we don't believe this. We don't believe the doctrine of the church. We don't believe it anymore. I don't believe in a God who locked me out of heaven. I don't believe in a God who lives up there. I don't believe that humankind emerged into paradise. I don't believe it. It's over. It's finished. It's gone. For heaven's sake, for our sake, let's bring Jesus to the 21st century. And the only response you get is, how dare you raise that question? How dare you, 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 you question the basics of Christian religion? And at stake here, I think, at stake basically is institution. Institutional authority, power, control, and, 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 and an enormous fear that if we open the gates to this intellectual, you know, uh, research and, and, and uh, discussion, if we open the gates, it's like everything would fall apart. And I want to say, no, it won't. You'll discover a story that's more magnificent than we ever had. And you'll discover that the task of the church today is to bring this wonderful message of Jesus to the world that needs it. But don't lock your church institution into a story that doesn't make sense in the 21st century. The young are not there anymore. Not only are the young not there, the greatest dropout in the church today is your 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds. <laughs> it is. Here we are. <laughs> hey? Yeah, I mean, of, of institutional, not from faith, but from institutional practices of church. And the great tragedy is that so many people are moving out and they're saying, I can't believe that stuff anymore. And, and it's like, where do they hear another story? Where do they hear the story that would enhance and ennoble and inspire and challenge? Who's going to tell that? Here we are, folks. That's our task, isn't it? We've got to do it. We've got to do it to be the body of Christ. Let's have another break. Then what I'll do then is I'll talk about prayer for about two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we'll go into question time for the last period, okay? So have, have a stretch for five minutes or so. In 1975, I think it was, I had worked in Papua New Guinea for four years and the missionaries of the Sacred Heart in Australia invited Armin Nigro, a Jesuit, to come to Australia and, and run a, a program to put all the members of the Australian province through this program of a 15-day directed retreat and a 10 days of faith sharing, mainly to help us get in touch with our own humanness. Because most of us have been through a novitiate training, a religious training that was very sort of stoical and, you know, get your act together. And there was no way that we were in touch with our our, our, our inner selves and it was both a way of getting in touch with the human Jesus and ourselves at the same time and I, I came to this retreat as I said I'd been in Papua New Guinea and I had certainly neglected prayer life and I did not want to go to this retreat you know it was like I had my tail between my legs like you know uh, this, this, this is going to be rather uh, arduous and Armand every morning gave a lecture and at the end of the lecture uh, he'd put up scripture readings and, and the, 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 the thrust of, of his uh, talks was to help us to take scripture and personalize scripture so you know to take a, a phrase like uh, I've carved you on the palm of my hands and to imagine Yahweh our God saying it to us personally 
So this day he, uh, amongst the texts, was Psalm 89. And I didn't know Psalm 89, and I went up to my room. And it was a very, very wet day, and I, I did a lot of running in those days. So I changed into my running gear. I was about to set off for a run, so I thought, oh, I'll look at Psalm 89 before I go. And it was, I will celebrate your love forever, Yahweh. Age on age, my words proclaim your love. So I went for this run, and I had, you know, Armand's instructions going through my mind, saying, Michael, don't just read the words, but imagine your God saying this to you. You know, turn the words round. And so I imagined, I imagined Yahweh, my God, my personal God, saying to me, Michael, I, 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 I drench you in my love, and I want you to proclaim my love. And I went for a 10-mile run in the rain, and the rain was like, you know, God's love drenching me. Now, here I was, I had come to that retreat, and, and as I said, I had my tail between my legs. So what happened in this moment of prayer was, I mean, it blew my mind. It was totally, totally unexpected. It was the, the richest, deepest prayer experience of my life. When my personal God reached through the sort of blanket of my stupidity, as it were, and blindness, and broke in and said, Michael, I love you unreservedly. Extraordinary moment of prayer. Here I am 35 years later or 40 years later, and I do not pray to that God. I don't pray to a personal God. So what's happened? What's happened? My window to the divine, growing up Catholic Christian and into priesthood, was scripture and was the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, and we put the name Yahweh on it, which would be offensive for Jews to hear me say that, and I respect that. But I'm also respecting that this is not a Jewish audience. The only way that the mystery that is the one, the ultimate, the only way that could break into my imagination and my consciousness was to do so through the window that I had. And that's precisely what happened. That the only way for the divine to break through into my consciousness and shake me up was to do it in the window that I was using. So I would never, 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 never say to people, do not pray to a personal God. I would never say to anyone, do not pray that way. We all pray according to the windows that we have. Maybe what we need to examine at times is, you know, whether the windows suit us or not. Mm -hmm. Whether the windows may need changing. What's happened in my life? in the last 30 years is the shift that we've covered some of it in the last 24 hours or so. For me, God is not the way I imagined in the 1970s when I imagined Yahweh as a deity in the heavens. When I took scripture shaped in that imagination and worked with that and imagined very much a male deity, although I was trying to say God's not male, but a male deity, a localized God, breaking through and saying, Michael, I love you, you're, and then, you know, you're in the, calm of my, in the palm of my hands. The rest of the retreat, I could take phrases like before, you're in the womb, Michael, I knew you. I could take all that and relish it. And what it did, of course, was expand my mind, my heart, and hopefully something of my generosity, but, but certainly my sense of self. Here I am 30 years later, and I don't pray that way. So what do I do in prayer? I try now to have a sense of awareness, a sense of appreciation that the mystery I call God, that this clay vessel with all its weakness and its imperfections, that I give this mystery that charges the universe, that I give this mystery a human expression. And I have 70 or 80 or 90 years to do this. And my prayer now is a prayer of awareness, hopefully of appreciation, hopefully it's a sense of wonder, a sense of awe. 
And it's a sense then of also a challenge. Michael, what are you doing with this? What are you doing with this? So when I contrast over a 30-year period the two sort of ways of praying, when I look at myself, and I'm only talking about myself in this, I know for myself I'm not losing anything, I have not lost anything, I hope, from the way life has shifted me from there to here. Now I didn't ask for that to happen. I didn't set out for that to happen. But what happened in the last 20 or so years of my life as I've been introduced to this whole new story of the cosmos and human beginnings and the divine at everywhere, it, it's like inevitably my sense of prayer began to change. One of the big changes came in, I, 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 again I can precise it, when uh, in 2002, which is about the last time I was here I think, uh, I was in St. Louis and a, a small faith sharing group of people, only about 10 people, uh, invited me to come and on the Friday night, uh, no the Saturday morning I think it was, uh, one of the people said, Michael, we're having a, a Eucharist tomorrow, we have a home Eucharist, would you write a Eucharistic prayer for us? And I had never done anything like that. And I thought, oh, okay. Uh, and I was sort of being polite because... Mm -hmm. So I sat at the computer, they showed me where the computer was, and I sat at the computer. So here's the question. Somebody says to you, would you write a Eucharistic prayer for next week's gathering? Okay? Think of the first sentence. You needn't tell me. What is your first sentence? What are the first words that come to your mind? Okay? Just think about it. No need to say it. What are the first words that come to your mind? Okay. I sat at the computer and I typed, Create a God. And then it was like a, this flash. No, it wasn't a flash, but it was like, Yes, Michael, what's next? <laughs> and that was the insight. And I thought, what am I doing here? I mean, these words that I'm writing, do I think there's a God out there listening to them? And even when we say them? I mean, create a God. I'm, I'm addressing someone. Is the someone listening? Is this prayer that I'm about to write for the sake of that someone, like, like this God needs to hear me phone in? As if they say, well, Michael, that was pretty good. You know, well, Michael, I really needed to hear from you. Now, that really got me thinking, what is prayer all about? So on the one hand, there's this, there's this personal prayer, which I think is about you know, appreciation of the divine, creative, energizing presence with us, whether I believe it's out there and everywhere, fine. However, prayer is about deepening our awareness of it. Okay. But when you get to vocal prayer, when you get to vocal prayer, I think it becomes rather problematic. And I think groups like, like this, we need to look at the challenge here. Let me put it another way. I would maintain that the first prayer that three and four year olds are taught by their parents or their grandparents are dear God prayers. Dear God, bless mummy, dear God, bless daddy, dear God, huh? Now that's fine, that's fine. Then we take them to church and they hear, oh God. And then you have a lifetime of exposure. You say grace before meals, create a God, dear God. We thank you, God. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that most Christians, including all of us here, grow up totally immersed in an idea that vocal prayer is about praying to a God? Because that's what our language suggests. And I work with what I would call, you know, uh, progressive liberal Christians day in and day out. And they say to me, oh, I'm free, you know, we're, we're, we're free of this idea of, you know, a God out there. And I think, let me hear the way you pray. Let me hear the way you pray. 
because so much of the prayer is addressed as if God were listening. And some and people say, oh, but I know God's not listening. And I say, look, I tell you, when I was at Boston College in the mid-1980s, one of the professors said to us, if you use he language about God, I will not correct your paper. I stopped using he language about God very quickly. Feminists will say to us, stop talking he language about God. He, H-E, or him, okay? Uh, or stop using man language, you know, be inclusive. And we say, oh, no, it's all right. I, I know if I use man, I'm, I'm, I'm including everyone. No, no, no. If you know that, stop using it. And I bring the same sort of reflection to our vocal prayer. And people say, I know if I'm saying, oh God, I, I'm not really, you know, I don't think there's a God out there with ears or listening, you know. I say, well, why, why is 99% of the prayer I hear addressed to God? Why is it addressed to God? Now, there is nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying change. I'm not saying stop doing it. I'm not saying that. And you, know, you wouldn't want to be in a position of, you know, in a small faith group and say, oh, you know, he's in the old prayer style. You know, he just prayed a prayer to God, you know. No, you don't want to be doing that. But what we need, what we need in the years to come is certainly is some sort of counterbalance, I think. And that's why I wrote the book, Praying a New Story. There's not one prayer in that book that addresses God. <coughs> the prayer I prayed here this morning. What I tried to do, what I tried to say to myself about 1902, that if I pray in public, the first thing, I will not talk to God. I will not address God. And I talk about this in the, in the book, Children Praying a New Story. But the first thing that I will do is affirm. We gather, if somebody says to me, Michael, will you say grace? Okay, so, okay, we say grace. As we gather here tonight, let us be mindful of the Spirit of God that has moved in our lives, has brought us here to this table. Let us be mindful of the Spirit of God at work in our earth that produced the food. Let us be grateful for the Spirit of God in the lives of Tim and Ro Jim and Rosemary who host us. And, and, and off you go. We open ourselves as we eat to the generosity of that Spirit, pledging ourselves to give it. Off you go, off you go. I haven't prayed to a God, I haven't prayed to a God. Which doesn't mean you have to change. But I, I, I mean, I'm here exhorting people to try and somehow do something like this. Otherwise, we keep our, our communities and ourselves and the children below us, we keep sort of trapped in a worldview as if we're constantly praying to God. Example I use constantly is the song Red Sails in the Sunset. Do we know this song? Can we sing it? Okay, off you go. Okay, right, are we good? <laughs> like, like, en enough, enough. <laughs> Some years ago, I was in Sligo in Ireland and asked them if they knew the song, and they all, yes, it was composed just down on the seashore here. Okay, Red Sails. What's the song about? What's, what's the thrust of the song? Here's Nat King Cole, or the loved one, standing on the seashore, singing this song. What's the concern in the song? What's the concern of the singer? The loved one, the loved one is where? Far across. Far across. And where is the loved one? Where? <laughs> in a boat. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> a sailing boat. Yes, okay, a boat with sails. And, and, and we even know the colour of the sails, eh? Okay, okay, okay. So the loved one's in a boat that has sails that happen to be red. 
Now what's the concern? So what? Okay, she's in a boat, she's in a sail. What, what's the concern? Come back home? Safely. safely? Yes. Is there a special concern about bringing her home safely? Yeah, because the saying was Swift winds you must borrow, head straight for the shore. We marry tomorrow, and she goes sailing no more. Oh. Whoa. Here's this poor lovesick guy standing on the seashore, and he's singing a song addressed to Red sails, for heaven's sake. Are the red sails listening? <laughs> no! No! It's, it's poetry. Hey? It's metaphor. It's a way of giving expression to the deepest longings of my heart and yearnings. Red sails, swift winds, you must burrow, head straight for the shore, bring her home. He's giving expression to his deepest longings within him. The red sails aren't listening. <laughs> It's not for the red sails sake. Blue moon, I saw you standing alone. I think much of our prayer is like that. Oh God, I'm so angry and annoyed. Well, tone it down, Michael. <laughs> no, there's not a God listening to this, huh? It's not a God. It, it, it's giving expression to something deep within me and, and it's poetry. Or a oh God, I thank you for the wonder of this day. Yes, I, I can pray that and I will pray that, but I know, I know it's metaphor. I know it's poetry. You know, I, I keep asking the question, what do you think is at the end of the prayer? Do we think there's a listening deity? And we say, no, I don't think there's a listening deity. Well then, let's be aware of that and maybe at least occasionally try and change prayer so it doesn't use you language, oh God, we give you, eh? Can we not try and move into that sort of shift? The difficulty here, the, 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 the problem is, the problem is the personal God, okay, which is problematic. Now. It's a big, big issue for most people. It's like, I've grown up with a personal God. It's like, you're not taking the personal God away from me, are you? And I want to say, I, I'm not taking anything away from anyone. We use our own windows to the divine. If the personal God notion works, then let it work and, you know, pray the language of relationship and, and whatever, okay? But know that you are in metaphor and know that you are in personification. Do not, do not fall into the mistake of literalizing your personal God into a reality. Hey? Because God is beyond all our human notions. And what happens, the problem is, yes, it's very fine, it's very good, and, and it's good for me to, to have a sense of a God who is personal, who loves me, and we speak the love language to one another, as it were, that's fine. But the end, the other side of that is that, is that when a religious movement locks itself into that notion of God, then you have a God who thinks about it. Eh? And so many people are caught into this notion. I prayed to God and God did not answer my prayer. Why didn't God listen to me? Or well, then the idea of a personal God, and this is God, the God in Scripture, this God has ideas who thinks about things. So you get a church institution that tells you, we'll tell you what God thinks. And they're playing on our notion of a personal deity. We say, no, 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 no. If you want to use God as person, okay, that, that's, that's personified, but, 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 but don't sort of literalize that into a deity who thinks about things, who plots and plans and intervenes and withholds, forgives. It's beyond all that. So does our prayer life somehow, somehow encompass this movement? Finally, prayer of petition. 
Do I believe in prayer petition? I believe firmly in prayer petition. I, for me, it's a bit like quantum physics, or like quantum mechanics. That a particle here is in instant communication with a particle here. There's nothing between them. Absolute nothing. And I believe that love expressed here has an effect beyond distance, beyond contact, over here. It's like it's a ripple. And, and it's in this mystery in which we all live and move and we have our being. And we call it God. It's everywhere. So metaphorically, we can ask God to bless Mary. But what we're really doing is trying to send her the cross here, I think. Let me give you a practical example. If I were running liturgy in a parish, then when it comes to the prayer of the faithful, I would have someone come and rather than, you know, you come to the pulpit and you say, uh, let us pray for Mary and John, whose daughter was killed in an accident this week. We ask God's blessing upon them uh, that they may be healed of sorrow, whatever, and off you go. Lord, hear us. And what do we say? Lord, hear us. Now just think about what we just said. <laughs> Who are we asking to hear? Lord, hear us. And we all say, Lord, hear our prayer. And I want to say, what? I mean, <laughs> what is this imagining? Are, are we, we asking a reality out there to hear us? So why, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep engaging in a form of prayer that sort of indicates that we're asking something out there beyond us to hear us and, and then to do it? <laughs> why not better someone comes to the front and says, let us raise our minds and hearts now to Mary and Jim, <coughs> whose daughter was tragically killed in an accident this week. And then you go on to the next one. Let us be mindful now of... And then you finish with something like, we offer all these prayers in the firm and utter conviction that everyone and everything is bonded in the mystery that we call God. And that the power of God here at work among us can do far more than we ask or imagine. To this let us give our Amen. Amen. Now, if we did that week after week after week, I think people would pick up the idea. We're not praying to a God out there, uh -huh. which our, what's our language suggests. And we begin, we begin to affirm in people, hey, this presence is really with us. So we need to affirm it again and again and again. So again, hear me, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't pray, you know, don't stop praying to a, to a God out there. But I, I just wish that we would have a movement that, that somehow would give a corrective to it. And, that, and that, a, that a key aspect of that would be affirmation. And again, it's in children praying a new story. How to pray with children, how to pray with children at school, for example. How would you pray with children at the beginning of a school day? Affirm the presence there. Call it out. Invite them to give expression to it. Don't pray to a God to send the blessing down upon us this day. And off you go. Okay. So that's going to end our filming session. And for now, we will move into a, a time of uh, uh, comment, question, uh, whatever. So.